You'll have to forgive the ridiculous gamer headphones because I have not yet figured out how to monitor my audio coming out of the PC yet without getting spillover into the microphone, so this is what I have to do for now. Alright, so what I want to show you today is something that's really fun if you're into weird apocrypha. Uh, this is basically a this is basically a little bit of irrelevant history that is only interesting to people who are into programming or like to see the internals of things that you're never supposed to have seen. But all the same, I encourage you to watch it even if you don't do any of those things because uh, it's pretty entertaining if you ask me. All right, so here's what I'm on about. So there's a developer that I always liked when I was a kid and their name was Capstone Software and they made garbage. Most of their games were fucking trash. Uh, they made, I think, the Trolls game, which was bizarre and, and indecipherable. Uh, they made something called Eternum that was also bizarre, also indecipherable. Um, they made a bunch of licensed titles that were also quite bad. Um, they made William Shatner's Tech War, uh, which was, from what I'm told, I haven't read the books, but I'm told they're terrible. And the game is certainly no exception. It's complete fucking trash. So Capstone put out a lot of crap, but they also did put out a couple of games that were pretty good. And one of them was Corridor 7. So Corridor 7 had the unfortunate history of having come out right after Doom, so it got completely trashed because it was based on the Wolfenstein 3D engine, which was instantly dated the moment Doom hit the market. I mean, there was no coming back. Anything based on the Wolf engine was going to be completely forgotten, and it, it was. So the game never had a chance, which is really a shame, because I've read an interview with the main developer on it, and it sounds like they really put a lot of passion and love into it, and they wanted it to be good. They were hoping it was going to you know, take the world by storm, and they had a lot of great ideas, and they put a lot of effort into it. I mean, one of the things you got to understand is that this wasn't just a map pack for Wolfenstein 3D. It wasn't just a reskin. They put a lot of work into it. So just to start this video out, I'm going to show you briefly what Corridor 7 looked like and point out some of the advancements that they made in development. Uh, I'm not doing a full video on it, because at some date I'm going to do a video about Capstone, where I'm just going to go through all the games that I played by them and everything I can find that, that looks interesting, uh, and I'll do a, a full review of the game at that point. And uh, something I should note is, I discovered that the Windows Me DOS is actually kind of broken and messed up, and it's better to get DOS 7, or even DOS 6, uh, so that's what I have, is a DOS 7 on the boot disk, and I found that everything seems to work a lot better with that. All right, so this guy here, Les Bird, uh, he's the one who led development on a whole bunch of capstone titles in the same time period as this. Okay, so first things first, let me show you this. If we go to adjust audio, we've got our usual settings, FM music, sound effects, CD music, and a master volume, but line in volume, what's this? I was confused by this and thought it was something novel and fascinating for a bit. I read the manual when I was all done making the video and discovered that it was actually a fix for an old miserable hardware problem. It used to be that you couldn't take input directly from the CD-ROM digitally or via an internal connector, so some CD-ROMs you just had to plug an audio cable into the front in the headphone jack, run it around to the back of your computer, and slam it into your mic jack. So not actually exciting or novel. I should note this has network support, which Wolfenstein 3D did not, so that's definitely something that this team added. And I mean, implementing network support for a game is not easy. Talk to any game dev. It's, there's a lot to consider. Okay, there's a bunch of things going on here already that I'm gonna stop and talk about. Okay, so just FYI, I'm turning off the sound effects because there's some sort of glitch going on in this computer right now uh, where the audio on the menu is working fine before I start the game, but then once I start the game, it sounds like this. Ugh. Okay, well I can't turn it off all the way, but I turned it down, so. Okay, so there's a few things going on here. First, I want to point out that they've completely redesigned the entire HUD. So none of the panels on the bar are in the same place as they are in Wolfenstein 3D. So it's easy to think, okay, well the people who made this just got Wolfenstein 3D and then added new textures and redesigned the maps. That's not the case. They actually wrote a bunch of code. So for instance, you'll see that there's light fall off. That was not supported in the original Wolfenstein. Everything was continuously lit all the way out, uh, which made a bunch of levels uh, look really stark and unpleasant. If they'd had the ability 
ability to decrease the light level, then you'd get a much more atmospheric game, and it would have been much more appropriate considering that at times you were supposed to be in a dungeon. Uh, additionally, they've changed the way that the ceiling draws so that it's got this gradient. Um, they've added a whole bunch more transparent textures. I think Wolf 3D had some transparent textures, um, but they just really stepped the game up. There's tons of them in this one. Uh, they've added Bob to the weapons. It was very early because, you know, Doom hadn't come out yet, so nobody really had a template for how to do that yet. Also, they've added a feature that I thought was super cool when I was a kid, and honestly, I still do, which is color cycling. Uh, that takes advantage of a feature of 256 color graphics, where you can redefine the palette colors on every frame so that a set of pixels can cycle through a series of colors to create limited animation. It's extremely cheap. You know, it's a very inexpensive way to add a bunch of life to your game. Uh, it was used on every single platform at the time, Genesis, SNES, everything. Prior to the development of 16-bit and 24-bit color, uh, this was just universal. But it wasn't in Wolf 3D, so they had to add that. There's a nice little personal touch if you go back through this door at the very beginning and turn to the right. Here's the names of everyone involved in the game. They decided to put the credits right here as physical objects instead of having you go to a credits screen. This was very strange to me when I was a kid, but all the same, it was something that reminded you that a group of actual people worked on this, which was kind of hard to envision back then. Games just seemed to materialize out of nowhere. Another thing I want to point out, they took advantage of the ability to edit the palette in order to implement a lighting system. So if you watch the distant wall here, they've added essentially a flash effect from your gun. Uh, unlike Wolfenstein 3D, almost every door is transparent, so you can see what's behind it before you open it, which is very handy in a game that's all about scaring you. Uh, you can see here they've used pallet cycling to create this force field effect. And I just got murdered by a floating eyeball. <gasps> okay, where did that guy come from? Through here? Nope. Wasn't back there. It must have been. No. Well, shoot. How do you get in here? So you can see here that they've used the pallet cycling capability to a really absurd level. I mean, they used it on just about every single wall panel that they could. All the computers do it. Uh, this is a simulation of a tape drive, which is super, super cool. They've actually, just by changing palette entries with no actual texture animation, they've been able to create the effect of a spinning magnetic tape. It's also these interactive computers. This obviously was not in the original Wolfenstein 3D engine. They had to code that. Okay, there's key locked doors, which you can open from a central computer. Also not in Wolf. Uh, all of the pickups in the game uh, were actually mounted in the wall, except for in the very late levels. So you actually have to hit space once to open it, and then a second time to actually take it. Uh, there's also these health chambers, which again use that cool pallet cycling effect. I always thought that was neat when I was a kid. So, you know, what they've created here is definitely a much more atmospheric, much more, you know, visceral game than Wolfenstein 3D was. Uh, and they've done it by adding a bunch of capabilities that weren't in the original game. So I have a lot of respect for this game. I have a lot of respect for the team that made it. Uh, I read an interview with uh, Les where he talked about the challenges and, and the you know ideas and the process of developing it. And it really sounds like all the people involved with this were just a, a stellar team. So yeah, uh, a great piece of software, definitely. But unfortunately, not enough. So Capstone didn't have their shit together, and as a result, they ended up collapsing a few years after this was made. Everyone got fired. Uh, some random company owns the IP for all their software now and won't, you know, doesn't even know they have it. So they never made a sequel to this, but they tried to. They wanted to make a second game in the series called Corridor 8. They started working on that in 1996 after the build engine was out. That was the engine that was used for Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, it was used for Blood. It was used for Redneck Rampage, uh, Shadow Warrior. Uh, if you're watching this channel, you probably know about the build engine. It had a lot of things it did that Doom couldn't do. If you ask me, I think it was an ugly engine. I don't think it looked nearly as good, but maybe that's just because every game that was made with it used an art style I didn't really like. All the same, though, it was quite a technically capable engine, and Ken Silverman made some pretty impressive visual and technical accomplishments with it. So it makes sense that they would use it for the second game in the series. Unfortunately, they didn't really get very far in making it. But when the company folded, Les took what was left of the software with him and ended up putting it on the internet a few years ago. So now I have it. And it's pretty wacky. The thing you should understand is that what I'm going to show you is not a beta. Uh, I don't even think it's an alpha. It's a development build. So at the point where they were still working on this before the company collapsed, they were basically in a stage where they were doing proofs of concept. They hadn't really moved forward on any of the serious development of the final game. 
Instead, this is sort of a playground, a sandbox, where they were testing out different ideas, implementing them piecemeal, trying things here and there. So as a result, it's pretty wacky. It was never meant to be seen by human eyes outside of the company. Uh, it was never meant to be released in any form. Uh, it was not at all representative of what the game would have been. This is just a snapshot of someone's sketch pad, essentially. I mean, yeah, this is the project they were working on. It's just that in the early stages of developing a game, it doesn't look like a game. I have seen some other coverage of this on YouTube, but none of it really went into the details of what you're looking at. So that's why I wanted to show it to you. So first things first, you can see there's literally a folder in here called source where you can find the source to the game. So this is actually the source to the build engine. So if we look in here, we can see, you know, this is from 1996, uh, signed by Les Bird because he was a primary developer there. And if we just flip down through this, you can see this is the actual source code that makes the game go. So this is getting the list of weapon names, establishing different types of ammo. It's instantiating state for different objects. This wasn't just a TC for Duke Nukem 3D. They got the raw source code for build and they made a game from scratch. I think it's easy when you hear about these companies back in the day that used you know, the Doom engine, that used the Wolfenstein 3D engine, that used the build engine. It's easy to think that all they were doing was essentially creating a mod, uh, a total conversion, something you could have downloaded off of ftp.cdrom.com and just dropped in a WAD file. That's not the case. They actually employed programmers. They were actually writing new game logic. So for instance, in Capstone's Tech War, there was a whole bunch of functionality in that that didn't exist in Duke Nukem 3D, that didn't exist in any other build engine game. Completely novel stuff. Bad, but completely novel. So I just wanted to clarify that as much as I rag on Capstone, like they were actually doing a serious job and they were competent at programming. The stuff they developed worked and they added a bunch of clever and forward thinking features to it. It's just that the design for it wasn't very good and the gameplay suffered as a result. I would not be able to compile this myself. Uh, this requires an ancient version of Wacom C and I would never be able to get it working. I, I just don't have the chops on, on old software like that. Fortunately, however, this came with a compiled copy of the game, which we can run. So get ready. All right. So why are we looking at the ultimate doom and why did it zoom in like that? Well, that's going to take some explanation. So real quick, I'm just going to show you something here. This is Ken Silverman's build demo. So this is what he would have sent you in order to get you started on developing a game in his engine. So this is all programmer graphics. All right. So when I start this, yeah, see, there you go. That spin. So in other versions of the build example game, that spin occurred in, in the reverse direction. It, it grew in from the center, just like the ultimate doom logo that we saw. Anyway, so yeah, this is this is what Ken would have sent you, and uh, it's pretty ridiculous. You can see it's all definitely programmer graphics. None of this is, you know, professional grade. The gameplay is very unrefined, uh, you know, gameplay being a loose term, but uh, there are pickups, but they're just there to demonstrate that there are pickups, so nothing happens when you pick them up. You do have a weapon, um, and it's just these orbs that you can fire. Oh! Okay, there's a doorway there, but I, I can't go through it, and... Now I'm in this cave. Okay, all right, so I show you that just to demonstrate this is what they were working with. This this is what they got, and they had to turn that into a new Corridor 7 game. All right, so if we go back to the run folder here, uh, so there's a number of things here. There's the game itself. Uh, there's an art editor, which is editart.exe. Um, there's palette converters, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of maps. These are all test maps from the developers to test out things they were adding to the game. Uh, and you can see there's some named Les, there's some named Mark. These are different things from different people who are working on the game. So I think Abel uh, were all the maps that were going to actually go into the game. Uh, Les test was all testing functionality for actual code that he was adding. So new types of monsters, new types of uh, floor areas, new types of visual effects, etc. Uh, and then the ones called pickup are for testing uh, physical pickups they're putting in the world. So I'm going to go through and show you a bunch of these, but not, not all of them. All right. So if we start the game again, the reason that it comes up with doom graphics is because they didn't have any graphics to work with. They couldn't take the ones from corridor seven. They weren't appropriate to the game and they were probably in the wrong format anyway. 
And then when you go to this screen, you get the uh, Duke Nukem 3D default menu background. Uh, and again, the reason for that is probably because having no anime graphics, having no resources that were appropriate for this to pull from Doom, uh, they just went ahead and pulled them from Duke Nukem 3D instead. So you can see they'd started to do modifications to the game. So for instance, they've replaced level or game with mission, where it says new mission. Um, they've replaced load game with retrieve mission, which is the terminology they used in Corridor 7. So then if we go to start a campaign, so we hit new mission, uh, we get to choose Allied or Axis. Now, I'm not sure if that was the final terminology they're going to use, but it is a, a little weird to see in this context. Uh, we can choose one of three missions, so one of three episodes. And then we get to choose a difficulty, and again, this mirrors what was in Corridor 7. So, as a result, there's this very, very strange progression where you go Corporal, Lieutenant, Captain, Major, all military ranks, and then President? That's a very strange rank. Uh, and then we get to two genders, Space or Female. Okay, and so now we've been plunged into what appears to be a mishmash of Doom and a game we've never seen. So what's going on here is, again, they lifted all of the weapon graphics from Doom so they wouldn't have to make new ones just to test functionality, uh, but you can see where they started to make level graphics of their own. So the floor is all graphics that they made, the wall is all graphics they made, I can tell you none of this is from Doom. Um, those lights might be from Duke Nukem 3D, as well as the ceiling. And you can see here there's some glitching going on with some of the textures. I'm not sure why that would be unless they accidentally made them animated in the system when they didn't mean to. As a result, there's a bunch of parts of this specific level that would definitely be epilepsy triggers, so I'm not going to go into those. I'll just show you the other maps instead. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on God Mode. And you can see in the lower left that the text shows up down there and flickers. So again, they modified that from Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, and then the weapon I have right now is technically the pistol, as I can demonstrate. See, it says pistol in the lower left, so I fire it. It works just like the chain gun in Doom, uh, except it's technically the pistol in this game. So if I go to weapon number four, that's the chain gun in this game. And it fires at the speed you always hoped the chain gun would fire in Doom. So then the second weapon is a shotgun that's clearly using graphics that they created. So I guess this is what would have actually been in the game. I mean, I don't know, maybe they ripped this from another game, but I don't recognize it, and I've played almost everything that's build engine based. Uh, there's a double-barreled shotgun, but it doesn't seem to behave any different. Uh, and then there's the missile launcher, which has its own explosion, which is very different from that in any other game I've seen. Uh, I've got God Mode on, but they implemented God, God Mode very strangely. Uh, the same goes for infinite ammo, which is also on. Uh, the ammo continues to count down, but when it hits zero, the gun just keeps firing. So that's the rocket launcher, and then we have the laser gun. And I've tested, and this doesn't seem to actually work. It looks like it does, but it won't actually kill anything. Then there's the BFG. Um, I'm not sure why they use the name BFG when they certainly weren't going to have that in their final game. Uh, it, this also acts very strangely and uses the rocket launcher graphics. And you can see there actually is a monster out there. And I'm going to run out there and show you that guy in a minute, but fortunately he's ignoring me for now. Uh, we also have a smart missile, again, based on the rocket launcher. Again, I'm not sure how it's supposed to work, because it just seems to poof when it hits anything. Then we have the Death Blossom, and you can see that fires rockets in all directions. Oh. Oh no, he's noticed me. All right, so I'm going to head out here and actually kill a monster. And now you can see that this guy is actually very, very large. Uh, he's presumably supposed to be some sort of boss test, or maybe just a test for their ability to scale sprites. Uh, but either way, um, I'm going to go ahead and waste him. See, he takes a lot of bullets, so I think he was supposed to be a boss of some kind. There we go. Now, interestingly, none of those guys activated when, my, when I fired my guns from up here, which makes me think they hadn't written the code for uh, monsters hearing you yet. All right, so the final weapon is the proximity mine, but I discovered if I fire that, it crashes the game, so I'm not gonna. All right, so if I go back here, something interesting happens. The lights go out, and I guess that is to test a sector effect that turns the lights off when you cross a line, and then you can turn them back on here. You also may have noticed that the graphic for that button was just a radioactive barrel. So again, they hadn't created any graphics for that yet. And it turns into whatever this is when you activate it. They were just using whatever they already had in the engine, pretty much. All right, so then if we open this door here, uh, you can see that there's actually a bunch of graphics already created that are, oops, that's what I was talking about. I'm not gonna go back in those flashy areas. Um, 
Anyway, but these graphics were definitely created for this game. These are completely original. All right, so that's all I can show you this level because if I go back here, you can see it right away turns into those messed up graphics. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop from this and then show you one of the other maps. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and load one of the straightforward ones, uh, which is uh, Abel V1. So that would have been, I believe, one of the actual maps that was gonna go into the final game had they finished it. Whoops, this is the same one. I think I wanted Abel V2. Ah, much better. Okay, so if we go through this one, um, we can see that there's a much more complex level geometry than in the original map that I showed you. Uh, they were clearly actually planning on making this a interesting final level to use in the game. Uh, nobody would have put this much detail into a test level. Now, I'm going to say that personally, just based on my experience with FPSs, you know, and my experience with FPSs from this era in particular, uh, such as uh, Cyclones and um, some of the other like wolf knockoffs like Blake Stone, um, I don't think this would have been a very fun level. I'm looking at it, I'm playing it, and I'm going, this looks pretty miserable. I mean, look at all these nooks and crannies. You would have had to, to do exactly what I'm doing. Run around, slowly pivoting into every single area. Uh, we've got probably some areas where items would have been. But each one of these nooks, I promise you, each one of these had a monster in it. On, on the higher difficulties and on the lower difficulties, at least half of them would have. I'm sure of it. And I would have hated playing that. Having to just constantly, constantly strafe through... You know, and just, just be constantly on the lookout for things shooting at me. Uh, you know, running low on ammo because I'm killing so many guys. I mean, it just would have sucked. The thing you got to keep in mind, though, is that even though I say that, this is a alpha, alpha, alpha. I mean, not even alpha, pre-alpha, right? I mean, this is a game that wasn't even close to completion. So all these maps may have been things that nobody else looked at. Maybe this guy was working on them, and when he showed them to his coworkers, they would have said, no, Alan, you're an idiot. These are terrible. Do it again. All right, and as we proceed, I think that the game was supposed to get a little weirder as time went on. Uh, so if we go to one of the later ones. Uh, so this is a map that's made up of a whole bunch of circles uh, that are interconnected. Um, so this is super maze-like. And if we actually go to the map, we can see the whole thing. Uh, if I hit tab here, here we go. So that's what the map looks like. Now, something I want to point out here is that uh, there are three auto maps. So I hit that and I can see myself and objects and for some reason there's this trail of objects that you can't see if you're in the normal 3d view um, but they're being left behind me and i'm not really sure what that was supposed to accomplish during development um, so if i hit the auto map again it takes me to this one which actually loads sprites and textures and this is a lot more akin to the uh, duke nukem 3d auto map uh, so this is probably something that you know was somewhere in the build source code they just turned on and again you can see that it's using these sprites that are being invisibly left behind me in order to trace where the character is going. Um, I'm just not sure what the purpose of that would have been. And if I hit it again, it gives me this overlay map, which again was a, a feature in Duke Nukem 3D. The reason I'm telling you about this is uh, because, again, sort of an interesting quirk of Capstone's specific copy of, of the build engine, um, they actually added a bunch of capabilities to it to make editing easier. So when I hit this first map mode here, okay, this is actually the build editor. This this is the, the map editor that came with the engine and was used to make maps in Duke Nukem 3D. The reason I can tell you that is one, I recognize you know the line and vertex design, um, but two, uh, the down at the bottom where you see that gray bar, uh, that was a build thing. That's where all the status and options and lists would have been. So they've basically transplanted the code that build used to uh, display the map in the editor into the game itself to make it easier to see, you know, vertexes and whatnot without having to write all their own code. So that's pretty clever. Uh, but again, this looks like a really bad level. This this looks extremely boring. Uh, I don't think I would have had a good time here. It just looks like uh, an incredibly tedious maze where I would have been going through every single one of these rooms just like going, please, please, can I just finish this? Uh, let's just look at the last one of these uh, able levels. Okay, and if we go to the map view we can see that it's another insufferable maze. It's worth mentioning that back at the time, it was pretty normal for FPS maps to be thought of as mazes because they hadn't really added a lot of the complexity that later FPS added with uh, box puzzles, you know, jumping puzzles, complicated uh, plot-based methods for opening doors, 
and gaining access to new areas. Um, and there wasn't much to do besides shoot enemies. And if all the enemies were just right there in front of you, instead of, you know, in some way being tucked away, so you'd have to use some skill to, to get access to them, to kill them uh, without getting killed yourself, what would the value have been? At the same time, though, I don't know. I have to put this next to some other games to see how it compares. I feel like this is a lot more maze-like than the other games were. Anyway, the other thing about this is uh, you can see there's no textures here other than uh, the same ones plastered all over every single wall and, and reused in pretty much all of these maps. So again, this would have been the map maker working on this without any resources from the other parts of the team. Because again, this was very, very early in development. So he was just laying out the geometry. Um, there's no real complexity in any of these levels, no buttons, no switches, nothing. He's, he was just laying out the, the basic geometry and would have added all the complexity to it later along with all of the textures and sprites and objects and whatnot. Okay, so with that done, let me show you some of the more entertaining ones. Uh, Les 3, that's one of my faves. Okay, so what's going on here is we are now in the middle of a test level. So this has everything in it. It's not supposed to make sense. Uh, it's just a whole bullet boss of every capability the engine had. In front of us, we can see there's a rotating platform uh, and that would have been used as a, a test for basically moving sectors. And I can tell you that the build engine had a lot of bugs with moving sectors, so I'm sure that Les spent a lot of time figuring out how to make those work well. Uh, in front of us is a test for a conveyor belt. Uh, we have a med kit in order to test pickups, uh, and then we have some enemies here. So I'm going to slaughter these ones so that I can show you what comes next. And again, you can see that even though I shot them, even though I made noise, um, none of these guys have noticed me. Okay, so with that done, I'm now going to step onto this platform here. And I've just had all these little tiny enemies released on me. And this big guy here too. And this is where things go completely nuts. The big guy moves at a ridiculous speed. Oops, I just walked through a broken wall. Uh, this guy moves way too fast. Uh, these little guys move way too fast and it's, it's hard to actually get them to kill them. Let's go ahead and just murder this guy. There we go. Oh, some peace and quiet. Oh. So again, um, I'm guessing what they did here is they, they didn't want to go through the effort of getting different sprites for every type of enemy. So these are probably technically all different enemies. You know, probably every one that was up there was a different enemy uh, in the game code, potentially with different behavior. They just used the same sprite for each one. Uh, so these would have been some sort of, you know, head crab. Uh, you know, face hugger kind of enemy. Uh, and then the uh, big guy would have been like a mid boss. All right, so also uh, this object here is not just a normal door. This is a whole moving sector. You can see the entire thing back there moves at once. Please be aware for the next couple minutes, there will be a lot of flashing lights on screen. So if you are photosensitive, please stop now. Uh, they've also got this whole series of rooms, which has a whole bunch of different door types in it. We've got a touch plate there to open that door. Uh, this room hurts you as long as you're on the uh, the yellow part. Uh, same with this room. Uh, this here is an elevator. Okay, more blinking. Uh, here is an elevator that goes down. And I think that's the end of the line. I think I have to go back up now. Okay, uh, I picked that up before I thought about it, but uh, you may have noticed that was actually a three-dimensional object. Um, I'm not sure if those were polygons or voxels, because uh, I believe the build engine added voxel support uh, very soon after Duke Nukem 3D was released. And finally, we've got some uh, three-dimensional barrels here. Uh, these appear to be sectors rather than, than like voxel objects, but you know, I could be wrong about that. Let's look at the map. Okay, and yeah, those, those are sectors. So that's actual uh, level geometry. So you could have done that in any one of the build engine games. That's not special code. Okay, so then this is one of my favorite areas. Uh, we have water here, and I can tell you the water does not work correctly. Um, I'll load in another map where it does, but uh, what it does do, watch closely, it adds a shimmer effect. And this is again custom. I'm quite positive this was not in any other build game. Uh, this must have been custom for this particular title. Uh, you can actually see that uh, over on the left side, uh, there's something going on where when the shimmer actually extends past where the edge of the screen would have been, it's substituting some other data. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the actual wall behind it or if it's wrapping around and getting pixels from the other side. Either way, it's a pretty cool effect. 
So this is cool because, I mean, this is something you could do back in the day. Um, you know, up through the 2000s, uh, this would have been considered a very expensive effect because it would have required a pixel shader. And up until the, you know, second or third generation of, you know, post GeForce graphics cards, uh, that was always an expensive thing. But, I mean, at the time, every single pixel in this game is being drawn by hand. It's being drawn in software by the CPU. So it doesn't really make much of a difference to offset it. So this probably costs them basically nothing in CPU power. I mean, nothing more than drawing the graphics by hand did anyway. So this sort of thing, I'm kind of surprised it wasn't implemented more on games back in the day because it's very easy to do. I mean, I did it myself when I was about 15 years old. I wrote a shader like this, if you will, in a uh, DOS application and it was very, very easy to write and it ran very, very quickly. So it's kind of surprising that nobody really did it back then. And indeed, no one did because this game never got released. Another thing they implemented was pushable walls, apparently. Now, see, technically that's just, you know, a moving door, but the way they implemented it essentially makes it a push wall. Now, Wolfenstein 3D had push walls, but I don't think that Corridor 7 did. And again, since this is a developer level, they didn't add a switch to get out of there, so I'm actually trapped. But that's fine because I'm done showing you this level. So this here was apparently a test bed for different types of three-dimensional pickups. And I think these are all made out of sectors. Let's check. Yep, they're all sectors. Uh, so each one of these is made out of uh, just textures and level geometry. So I'm not sure whether they intended to use sectors in the final game uh, that would just be deleted when you picked up the object, or if they were planning on using this as a test bed and then implementing their own three-dimensional objects. But either way, uh, they look pretty good, and it would have been really neat to see a build engine game that had this type of object in it. It would have given it a lot more... Uh, sort of forward-thinking kind of quakey feel to it. I mean, because honestly, at this point, other than the fact that there's no complicated geometry, you know, room over room type objects, uh, this is looking pretty good. Uh, I mean, this this kind of looks pretty quakey already. There's actually a version of the room that has more things in it. Uh, again, these are all made out of sectors, but each one of them looks really, really good. Uh, here's, I guess that probably would have been some rockets, uh, sort of an auto map, um, first aid kit, and then some barrels. All right, the only thing remaining to show you is uh, what I'm interpreting as character map. So this, I would say, is definitely a sort of uh, inter-level area. Uh, this must have been some kind of, uh, I guess, story map, if you will. Uh, it just looks too sedate to, to really be part of a map that would have had, you know, fighting and monsters on it. Um, so I suspect they would have been putting NPCs back here and, and that sort of thing. And again, I want to point out how this really has a kind of uh, Half-Life 1 aesthetic going on it. I mean, they've got a lot of stuff here that looks great. They did this nice sloped handrail uh, for the stairs here. Uh, Duke Nukem 3D supported that, but it wasn't done very often. Um, I mean, if people did stairs, they were usually just uh, plain stairs with no handrail, or they were slopes, also usually without a handrail. Uh, so again, they've created a fairly human-looking area down here. This is uh, pretty clearly a sort of storage locker with a whole bunch of equipment locked up. The whole area is clearly built using textures that they'd actually finished, so it looks, you know, in character. So you can sort of get a, a notion of how this game might have might have looked. Uh, they've also got, you know, what would come later, the box puzzle. I mean, yeah, there were some of these in, like, Duke games, but not to the level there were in, like, Half-Life and, and, you know, later Quake and whatnot. And obviously we've got some barrels hanging out to sort of give you the kind of, you know, debris strewn impression that you're in a place that humans actually used. And a pretty convincing forklift for the time. I mean, not great. There were similar things in Shadow Warrior, but uh, I feel like they did a much better job with this one, especially this uh, very curved looking sloped back. They've also bothered to put these crates on pallets. Nice design decision. I mean, in general, just look at it. It looks really solid. This looks like uh, an actual place. It doesn't look like the, the sort of abstract level design that was in Doom and, and uh, kind of in, in Duke Nukem 3D. Duke Nukem 3D looks a little more lived in, but not like this. Okay, so call that a little disjointed, but I mean, it's a pre, 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 pre alpha. So what do you expect? The game itself game is pretty disjointed. So yeah, the purpose of that wasn't to really demonstrate anything about what the final game would have looked like. Uh, obviously, that was nowhere near what they were actually intending to put out. The whole point of it was just to show you what it looks like when a game is very, 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 very early in development. It's full of programmer graphics. Uh, it's full of resources ripped from other games. A while back, there was somebody who posted some development screenshots from Splatoon in the earliest eras of development, and it looked like a bunch of white cubes running around because getting the functionality down was a lot more important than getting the graphics down, so they did that first. 
So it's just an interesting peek into what developing software looks like, especially that in 1996, things really haven't changed. My understanding is that a lot of the weirdness that we saw here resembles a lot of the weirdness we'd see now, even though it's 20 years later. It's really a shame this game never got released. I would have liked to see it. I really would have enjoyed having a game that ran on the build engine that wasn't fucking garbage like everything else that came out on it was. I wasn't really a fan of Redneck Rampage. I hated Duke Nukem 3D, even at the time. I wasn't that big a fan of Shadow Warrior. I mean, everything on that engine was really campy, and it would have been nice to get something that wasn't. Something that was a little more serious. Blood was excellent in terms of gameplay, but was also campy. This one would have been a lot closer to the atmosphere of, like, aliens, and it would have been nice to see that. Anyway, I hope you got something out of this, even though it was just me running around in some broken old half-baked software. Quarter-baked? Eighth-baked? Unbaked. Raw. But yeah, I thought it was really cool to look at. I hope it was cool for you, too. If I can find other stuff like this, you know, uh, betas or, like, turbo alphas, things that were never supposed to see the light of day, I'm going to put them up here as well, because I find that stuff super, super fascinating. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Take it easy.